You're listening to CKUA Radio. My name is Grant Stovall, and I'm really thrilled to be joined right now by one of CKUA's favorite ever voices. Lionel Rollett is here. Hey, Lionel. Hey, Grant. Good afternoon, and thank you so much to have me. This is a pretty exciting time because we are taking an opportunity to celebrate what Lionel Rolt has meant to the station, what uh, the way that you have helped to shape the sound and the story of CKUA and the impact that you've made on the community out there and maybe just a little bit of vice versa as you're bidding farewell to daily DJ duties. Uh, we're going to take stock and maybe look back a little bit. And, and Lionel, maybe we could get started right at the start. Like, so before, you know, for those that just know Lionel Ralt, the CKUA DJ, what were you up to in your life just before CKUA came a knock and became part of your life? Now, I was a full-time gigging musician, you know, and wandering around the world quite aimlessly, uh, just playing music to anyone who would stand still long enough to hear it. Um, I was doing a gig in Hinton, of all places. So, uh, I don't even remember the name of the place, but I got a call, and it was really quite startling because I thought, why is somebody phoning me? Like, I was actually on stage singing a song, and one of the barmen ran up and said, there's a call. I put, okay, I guess I have to stop. And I ran over there thinking there was trouble at home. No, it was some volunteer for CKUA saying, would you play a benefit at the Arden Theater? And we're talking several months later. Like, it wasn't any reason to emergency call me. But nonetheless, I said, sure, and went back to my gig and forgot all about it until the day came. And then I ended up out at the Arden doing this quite elaborate uh, benefit fundraiser for CKUA. And I arrived good five hours before I was supposed to be on stage. I don't know why, probably because I'm too stupid to read the contract, but whatever the deal. So I'm sitting drinking coffee, and every various artist that wanders in who's involved in this, of course, I know them from somewhere, so we're shooting the breeze and talking, and I didn't realize that the volunteers in the room wearing the CKUA T-shirts were actually the CKUA management. So anyway, I got a phone call a couple of days after this, and I went, you ever think of being on radio? They didn't say, man, can you ever run your mouth? And you seem to have, like, circular breathing down like Ross on Roland Kirk or something. They just said, you should be on radio. And so that was the beginning, the infamous start to my radio career. And what was your reaction when that idea came up? Well, I thought it seemed out of left field. You know, and I, I hate to sound mercenary, but I did say, do you get paid? And they said, well, yeah, you won't get rich, but there's money in it. And I went, cool, you know. Point me to the microphone. So that's what we've been doing ever since. Started off doing a one-hour radio show. What kind of show was that? It was supposed to be a blues show, but I was bored very quickly, you know, because Cam and Holger have great blues shows already, and I could, I just couldn't see where, how am I doing anything new here? So I started playing R&B. You know, I started playing, you know, James Brown and Aretha and stuff like that instead of just strict blues, although I did throw in your Muddy Waters and your BB King. But it, in the fullness of time, that became the R&B review, and then that did have a distinct flavor. And that led to the next one, and that was Lionel's Vinyls, which is very much what it is now, a little bit more eclectic, perhaps, than it was now. So anyway, that's how it started. And eventually, because I insisted that Lionel's Vinyls be live radio, little did I know that I put myself in the way of getting phone calls to fill in for people when they were taking vacations or when they were ill. And so that's how we get here. That's how we're here. <laughs> and how many years ago was this when yeah, you did your about, first show? I think it was about 25, 26 years ago. Wow. And I kind of feel like, I mean, I was out there in the listenership and I felt like, uh, you know, this is an exciting new voice, both literally and, you know, in terms of being like a programming mind. And I wonder, like, intuitively, what was your instinct? Like, how did you decide to approach crafting a radio show when you first started? Well, I was very uncomfortable when I first arrived and everyone kept saying, you know, how expert I was in my field, I really felt that. No, you know, that's like having a glass of water from the ocean and then now trying to foist yourself off as an oceanographer or something like that. I thought, no, I have to be who I actually am or I won't be able to keep this up for more than a week. There were times in the earliest days of live radio, you know, we were playing CDs and, and vinyl at that time, you know, live, like real time. And I had announced a song, I got them all set up, told a really good story, a really insightful story, and then dropped the CD on the floor and it rolled <laughs> under the console. So now it's about a yard and a half under the table here. And I sat there, you know, thinking, how would Bill Cool handle this, you know? But I couldn't really think of how that is. So I said, just a minute, folks, I've dropped the CD. And then I crawled under there and got the thing, hauled it back out, <sighs> blew it off, stuck it in there. And now that song, you know, well, I got so many emails 
of people who just roared. They just thought that was the funniest thing they had ever heard on radio. And it was pretty much the earmark of my style. You know, if, if things are happening, they're actually happening. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that they're not. And if I look like a bonehead, now you're getting to know the real me. And, you know, so we're, we're all going to get along just fine. When you got here, the sort of the culture of CKUA and the sound of CKUA was a bit different. What was it like for you to break into that? Well, I think I was a very jarring note, and I, I didn't intend to be. I, but I had told you earlier, um, it just seemed like a totally undoable thing for me to pretend to be somebody that I wasn't. I couldn't pretend that I was a BBC announcer and have, you know, that carefully modulated tone or for that matter, even necessarily be speaking proper grammar. I'm just going to talk as best I can and try to communicate my excitement and my love for the music and everything to do with, you know, around the music. Um, that met some resistance, but the audience, I think, carried the day. They, it really was powerfully well accepted. And I think in a way, I hope that it broke down this See, there are other radio stations that will present that kind of really upright, you know, professionally highly polished approach to music, but that's not for everybody. I think most people wanted to get to know the real person behind the mic. They didn't want to hear an image, but a real person. And I think that's what we see now more and more. Our shows are, are personality-driven. They are not only do you have Allison being Allison, but you have her playing the music. You know for a fact she loves. This is not, you know, she's not just a job, the job description she has to play this particular bag. This is her bag. And I think we have that now. So I think that when you see some of the new, you hear some of the new voices like Lisa Wilton, you know, you know, oh, this is her thing. This is who she really is. And I think that's, um, you know, I think, I don't, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, that one grain of snow more and it causes the avalanche. I guess he, he could, that one grain of snow could take huge credit. You know, look what I did. But actually, I think it was probably, you know, I think it was a world waiting for that to happen. Well, was there anybody that was aboard on staff that kind of helped to usher you into, you know, to induct you into the order of CKUA DJs? Well, you know, the ones that were most positive and gave me the very best advice were uh, Seb Saverin and... Uh, Leonisco and Kathy Innes. They were very inclusive, said, oh, just be who you are. Just enjoy yourself. Play the stuff you like to play because that really comes across. And uh, I met with a little bit of, I, I, I won't say negativity, but it was quizzical perplexity. You know, people, what what exactly are you? What fish nor fowl are you, you know? But I do remember Bill right at the very end of his time, which was, what, 40-some years, he actually came in and gave me a really uh, strong endorsement, said, I think that you probably are the face, you know, you're the sound, the tone of the new CKUA, you know. And how did that feel? Once again, somewhat perplexing. I was kind of mumbling my way through radio at that time. I wasn't feeling particularly confident. I didn't feel like a shining light. Uh, I think we should probably put Jack Hagerman, John Worthington on this list, who he was really very, you know, he decided, oh, yeah, you've, you got it. You're the guy, you know, and I, but I think he just told everybody that, I think. He probably told guys who were standing at the bus stop outside of CKUA that they had the sound, you know. It was always very positive. Well, I want to ask you about just, like, how hard you had to push for your vision, because you're obviously programming from the heart, like you have this wellspring, a whole lifetime of background knowledge, but you're really leading with your heart. And uh, I wondered, you know, how hard did you have to fight for your own vision of what CKUA sounded like to you? Well, I, I had no beef with what CKUA sounded like. I just thought that it could actually expand and move. I, my thoughts were, from playing live gigs for 30 years prior to showing up here, is that um, I've been out there in the province. I've stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with these people. They're, you know, I've played gigs for the entire strata, you know, all the various strata of society. And I could feel what audience were going to be a market for the particular song I was about to play. I could say, I could see these people. I played to them, you know. And um, so when I met Resistance, because there was a, you know, there was a faction that thought, no, that's not the CK way sound. And I kept saying, if you steer more into the, the bulk of the audience out there that are not being serviced by any radio service, but if we move towards them, you're going to find a huge upsurge in listenership.
and th- that music that those people that you know weren't being serviced by radio that were kind of being left on the cold shoulder what kind of music were you spinning for them that would you know you felt like would really touch them well people like los lobos delbert mcclinton um you know, endless numbers of, of people, that, but just more blues and roots music and Americana. And, you know, uh, I, I did love my soul jazz, so I started bringing in Jack McDuff and Jimmy Smith and you name it, all sorts of cool, groovy music. I, I wanted to keep it moving. I did, you know, at the suggestion of, of uh, people said, well, keep it more eclectic. So I went and I learned things like African music. I, I became very fond of Oliver Mitsukutsi. I became very fond of the... Uh, uh, Fete Kute and all this stuff, you know, a lot of African groove music, but very clearly underlined with a felt marker, groove music. If you had a groove, you had a shot at being on my show, and if not, well, then the line is very long to the right, you know? I feel like that's really a through line through all the music that you played. It's interesting because you have this grasp on all these different eras of all kinds of different popular music, and yet I see you here every day cracking open the new albums, getting into them. I hear you every day spinning the best of them. I wonder how is it that you manage to keep, and they've all got a groove, like there's, there's, a, there's a vibe that runs through your show. It right. doesn't matter whether it's something you know, from an indie rock band that's brand new or something from you know, a 1927 jazz session, but there's always a kind of sense of life at the heart of it. Well, I'm very big into rhythm. And, you know, when it, with a guy with very limited musical talents like myself, I always used to tell people I've got six licks and a hundred grooves, you know, and it, there is some truth to that. And um, I also feel that, and I don't want anybody listening at this moment to think, oh, well, I don't play that kind of music. I play lovely, soft, poignant, insightful folk music, you know. Well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and there are venues for that. But in my time slots, I always felt like people are at their work, and they want to keep kind of a beat. You know, it's so much easier to do things in life if you're grooving. It just, it just imagine in your mind's eye pushing a very deeply stuck car out of the ditch. You know, if everybody gets the groove, that car will come out of the ditch. And if they don't, it won't. And I've always felt that. All, ever since I served, you know, first started going to, you know, five years into my musical career, I felt the groove will actually, the rhythm will actually carry you when just about all else is failing, you know? So that was my theory. You either get in the groove or you're stuck in a rut. Well, there you go. Ba-boom. <laughs> so, t-shirts. <laughs> right, t-shirts, Soon please. available on the website. <laughs> so, Lionel, I'm really curious to know because, as you mentioned, you, you brought this fresh perspective just from being yourself, but also from being a lifetime gigging musician, traveling musician. Uh, what sorts of perspectives do you feel like that afforded you when you approach your radio programming? Well, I think more importantly than being a gigging musician, which is a thing, but I was the band leader. And so I'm the guy who takes the flack from the guy who hired us, you know, saying, you guys suck. Nobody wants to listen to this crap, you know. I also, I remember once writing out a, 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 in my mind's eye, and I explained it to the band. We were all sitting around a, a coffee shop with a big table between us and I said imagine this table is a song list and on this song list is only songs you like the the rule is there can't be any songs that you don't want to play but at any given time in any given room we only can play the ones that fit so at no time are you playing something you don't like but this time we're not playing the Leonard Cohen suicide ballads because it's 10 30 at night and people are dancing you know, there will come a Tuesday night when it's only you and the chairs and one thoroughly stultified bartender with his head down on the table. And you can play those Leonard Cohen songs. It'll be very perfect, you know, it'll be perfect for that gig. There's a strong sense of mission and of the task at hand. And that's that's what you're here to do and that's what you're executing. I would never be able to sit in a room and play music and have to like, you know, just so clearly this isn't working. This sucks and they know it and I know it, you know. I'm always searching, you know, okay, well, we hold on for a second. Try this one, you know, try this angle. And I have a very wide range of music. My parents were loved music of all kinds and played it and sang it ever since before I was born. So there was no, I never, you know, quite frankly, I never knew there was a difference between the blues and R&B and country music and pop. I, never, I didn't, it was years later that people so you know, you'd be playing one of your favorite songs and they say, I don't like country. I think... Well, stop me then if I ever start playing whatever that is, you know, and found out that that was what I was playing. But I, I never knew the difference and don't want to, quite frankly. I, you know, I want it to be like 
the heart is the litmus test. If it moves you, I guess it's a good piece of music for you. I, I don't want to go outside and start telling people there's only good music and you can't, if you don't like this, you suck, you don't know anything. Uh, no. If it moves your heart, you found something that you should take, that is your valuable thing to you. That's something of value to you if it moved you. Well, you have that uh, lifelong musician work ethic, and you know, when you show up here every day and like you put your hard hat on, you grab a stack of music to start uh, winnowing down what you're going to play for people that day on your show, uh, how do you approach it? Well, I don't winnow down per show, and I remember having this discussion with Ken Regan in the days when he was my overlord, you know, I said, he said, you don't put any time in your... It, it was funny, actually, because Terry David Mulligan was sitting in another chair, and I think we were actually between... Like, a song was playing, we were on the air, and somebody said, how how much time do you put in to research your show? And before I could open my mouth, Mulligan said, 40 years. And, you know, and I had to laugh. He was right. Because what I have here, and it drives everybody crazy on the technical staff, I just have this absolutely overwhelming library of music that I've stuck aside. I have, like, 20,000 songs all of which I know are good. I could actually pick them blind, but I don't, that's not the one for now. And I, and many, many times within, literally, you've been in the room when we've been five seconds to the next song supposed to start. It's hard And I sudden, <laughs> it dawns on me, that's not the right tune. And I will scramble, even if I have to sort of start making nonsensical talk, which is hard to tell the difference between my sensical talk. Anyway, but while I'm getting another tune, getting it loaded and play it. But, you know, I've had so many people contact me over the years saying, it just seemed like it was just an unbroken thread throughout the entire show, and I couldn't leave my car. I just sat there outside. People thought, who is this weird person sitting in an idling car? But, you know, and I I find that funny because those songs weren't, some of them weren't even available, weren't even in mind till five seconds before they were played. It just has to call your name. Yeah, I'm a band leader. I start feeling something. These people want this. You know, when I first started doing live radio with Lionel's Vinyls, um... It freaked me out for the first five or six times, and I couldn't, uh, what are you supposed to do here? I feel weird, you know? Then one day it hit me, this is gigging. This is what you've always done. And so even though I couldn't see the audience, I started started to feel them. And then from that time on, I've never really looked back. I just ran my mouth, you know, said whatever came to mind, played whatever came to mind. And I think there's something about music that doesn't have to be overthought. I, I there were times when I used to look at some of my colleagues, you know, scribbling notes as hard as they could go, and I thought, you know, you might just want to read for the pleasure of it and don't take any notes, and then just remember the stories that you do remember and, and have some faith that the ones that are relevant to you, hence to your audience, have stuck. And the other ones can just go by. You don't necessarily don't need to know who Elvis Costello's second cousin married to make this song work, you know? It's about the power of the music. And Nothing what it means personal, to Grant. Hey, I, I'm not like you didn't a, have to yeah. say my name when you said that. I think his cousin's name was uh, Eileen. Anyway, yeah. uh, hell of a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really curious to know about like you're more visible than most radio folks because you're out there doing it in the community, playing live on, on a really regular basis, and have been doing so for decades. And people come up to you, and you mentioned that people are touched by your programming and they get things out of it. What are some of the, I mean, you've been through a lot with these people, you know, whether you hear from them because they've donated an hour mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe it's in honor of a, of a marriage or, or a death or, you know, yep. there's so many things. Is there anything that comes to mind that seems like to leap out at you as like an interaction with, you know, the CKUA listenership that's profound or maybe just something in general about that connection? So many of my listeners and donors and I have just become friends. This was just a vehicle to become introduced to each other. It wasn't, uh, you know, it's never, I, I really attempt very quickly to dispose of any concept like, hi, I'm on the air and you are a listener. It's like, yo, you know, that's weird. I was talking into the same microphone you were listening to. That's neat. You know, and like, I don't want any... I don't want any falseness. It's hard It's hard slugging to keep that up, you know, to tr try to remember how incredibly important and interesting you are. Well, just be what you are and wander around. To me, you know, there's a Sufi saying that says words that start in the heart will land in the heart. And I, of course, added an addendum because I can't shut up, is, yeah, otherwise they'll rattle like a stone in your hubcap. They don't mean anything. They're just a noise. I think people, when you pick a song you truly love, it finds people's hearts. 
So when you uh, survey CKUA, like maybe thinking about years from now, I mean, you're going to be still having your hand in and hosting Lionel's Vinyl, but what would you like to see CKUA evolve towards now that you're stepping back from the day-in, day-out uh, radio battle? I don't think we should be prescribing music to people as like a top-down kind of thing. We're in our ivory tower and we cast down our bonbons to the benighted masses, you know. No, not so much. I think just get, you know, like that's why when you're playing a live gig and you're standing on a stage maybe two feet up off the floor, sometimes not even off the floor, right on the floor, and the whole room is dancing, you're actually dancing too. You know, you're part of that dance. It's a communal thing. I hope that continues. I hope it expands. I hope that... um too much theorizing kind of uh, will drop away. No, not so many graphs, please. Not so many Venn diagrams. Let's just, you know, feel it. Take off the guitar and dance. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just go with your heart.